Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to tonight's evening sessions. This will be recorded and it will be live on our Facebook page. So it is your choice if you want to have your cameras on or not. Um, please put any questions you have in the chat and we will make sure they get answered throughout the program. Um, I am Kirsten Wellness. I'm here at the Alice and Jack Wirt Library. And Evening Sessions is a monthly adult program series featuring a fun and engaging mix of presentations, lectures, workshops, demonstrations, author visits, and performances on topics covering the arts, culture, history, science, and more. We have a couple other upcoming programs I want to talk about first. Next Thursday, July 29th at 7 p.m. on Zoom, there is a program on hoarding, and that will be on Zoom, so you'll have to register through our event calendar in order to get that link. We have two evening sessions programs in August. The first one will be on Wednesday, August 4th at 7 p.m. It is Showers of Fire, the annual Percy Meteor Shower by Mike Murray through the planetarium here in Bay City. That one will be virtual only on Zoom, so you'll have to register through our event calendar to get that link. The one later in the month on Wednesday, August 18th at 7 p.m. is the craft beer industry, the good, bad, and the thirsty with Kevin Peel from Tri-City Brewing, and that one will be our first back in-person evening sessions here at the Alice and Jack Wirt Library. It will also be streamed on our Facebook page for those who may not be able to attend in person or who would still like to attend virtually. So we hope to see you at those. You can see all of our other programs on our event calendar. We also have our newsletter that comes out that you can see on our website, or if you happen to be in one of the branches, you can pick it up there. The summer reading program is still going on. If you haven't signed up yet, it is through the Beanstack app, or you can access that through our website. And we also have paper logs at all the branches and some fun blue bags that you get for signing up as well. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for tonight's evening sessions. Tom Trombley is the Vice President and Chief Historian of the Castle Museum of Saginaw County History. He has a lifelong interest in local history, which makes this a perfect job for him. And tonight he's going to talk about the Great Saginaw Fire of 1893. So thank you for being here, Tom. Um, thank you so very much. And I'm speaking from my office and there we're not far from the central fire station and there were fire engines um, in the background and I didn't arrange those so that for, as an opening. So you may hear some traffic noise. I hadn't really realized that. Um, I have a quick question if it wouldn't be hard to unmute everybody for one second. Um, there. I grew up in Sagna, and part of the mythology of Sagna is this great fire of May 20th, 1893, and how the community rebuilt itself, really pulled itself up by its bootstraps and rebuilt the area that was destroyed during this, this tragic event of May 20th. Um, those of you for or in Bay City, how many of you are aware, this is just a yes or no question, how many of you are aware that there was a similar event one year earlier, and I can't remember the exact date, but in May of 1892, it would have been in Southern Bay City around um, around Broadway. So when I come in Veterans Memorial Parkway, that area um, around Roma's, uh, Roma's Italian restaurant um, was destroyed by a similar fire in 1892. Is that something you were, that everyone's aware of? No, 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 no. No, and it's, it's really an interesting um, kind of comparison. So what I'm going to talk about is an archaeological dig we did, but I'm really more um, concerned with the overall history of what occurred on May 20th, 1893, and how it was interpreted and reinterpreted um, over time. And so I started out my beginning um, slide is a headline from 
um, May 20th, 18, or right around May 20th, 1894. And it's called The Building Progress of a Year. The district made desolate by the flames has risen from the ashes. And, you know, we think that news in 1894 was completely accurate, but as we'll discover, there's more than one way to interpret what occurred in that following year. So with that, I'll give a little background and then we'll move into the story of the fire of 1893 and then we'll have questions afterwards. And my screen has locked, okay. Bear with me for one moment. Oh. Um, of course, Saginaw and Bay City up oh, there we are going to go, okay. Um, now, as I disorganize myself by having mechanical problems, I'll get back to the actual subject. Saginaw and Bay City have a shared history that we were both great lumbering progress centers. And of course, um, Saginaw, which was two separate communities and the fire happened on the east side, but Saginaw um, grew tremendously at the beginning and East Saginaw grew tremendously at the, business, the beginning of the Civil War. And it was said that somebody who left for the Civil War and came back in 1867 would barely have recognized the community um, where they left. And this is Sag, a bird's eye view of East Saginaw in 1897. And of course, the secret of both Saginaw and um, Saginaw and Bay Cities success were becoming the great lumber processing centers of the Midwest of actually the United States. And this is just photographs of some of the sawmills and these become very important in the fire of May 20th, 1893. Um, and if you're familiar with Saginaw, this would be Eddie's Dock. So if you were coming, going west on the East Gen on the Genesee Avenue Bridge in Saginaw and you were looking to the north, to the southwest, this is what you would have seen in 1888. Um, but it isn't probably what you would have seen in 1893. Um, but Saginaw had more than tripled in population by 1888. Um, by 1885 and was Michigan's third largest city. And, but 18, the 1880s were a very difficult time for this region, the late 1880s, um, because the lumber boom that had peaked about 1882, 83, um, I always describe when I'm giving a tour, it's like a bell curve. And um, I realize you can't see my hand motions on the screen, but I was doing the outline of a bell curve. So in 1882 is the peak lumber, 82, 83 are the peak lumbering years. And it really starts to level down. So by 1890, um, Saginaw was in a very different place than it had been um, in the eight, a decade earlier. And um, was the city really searching, a region really, searching for a new economic boost? And the sawmills, which are, I have a close up of the ones, if you're familiar with Sagna, this would be Ojibwe Island in the port, in the center here. Um, but the sawmills were starting to close, that the lumber, the forest had been exhausted and um, Saginaw, really had the potential for having just kind of a very long decline, even though it was Michigan's third largest city. And there was a lot of capital that had been made during the lumbering period. There were attempts to um, bring logs in from Canada and from other areas to process in Saginaw. Obviously, the Canadian, go the Canadian government wasn't very fond of that. So, um, when the beginning of 1893 dawned, and there was also a national panic, um, Saginaw was coasting on its laurels um, and really living from the uh, from the resources that had been um, developed, had been the ca the cash that had been made during the great great lumbering boom. So um, when 
in May of 1893 came along, the newspapers, when you read them, are full of talks about the Columbian exhibition in Chicago. Um, Saginaw had its own room in the Michigan building. Um, and it, but they also give hints that this is a city and a region that are in economic decline and it really in a very perilous position. Um, there's attempts to bring in new industry. Um, there's just the slightest hint that coal mining will become a major, um, a major focus for the next dec decade or two. Um, but it really wasn't a real certain um, future. And one of the things that I always point out at this point, and I will probably point out again, is that between 1890 and 1900, Saginaw lost 10% of its population, the city of Saginaw lost 10% of its population. Um, Saginaw had originally been several smaller communities, the two major communities, East Saginaw and then the West Side, which was called Saginaw City, um, had been joined by the act of an act of the state legislature in 1889. And a new city hall had just been completed in 1893. Um, and although it, it was a it was a thriving city, but certainly one that was had a lot of questions and the thriving layer was not certain. And there were complaints about the abandoned sawmills that were along the river. There were some that were still operating very robustly, but there were a number of them um, that were, um, were abandoned. And one of these would come into play to, in what happened. And so what happened in the afternoon of 1893, um, it was described as like a day that was like an autumn day with a very strong breeze. Although it was spring, um, the leaves were blowing, um, which I always find odd for a spring day when I write about it, have written about the fire and talk about it. But you just kind of picture a spring day that really doesn't feel like spring. It's very hot, it's very dry. It maybe feels like one of those September days where you know the snow's coming soon, but um, instead you're waiting for summer and spring to arrive. And what happened was, um, and I'll get the exact time in a few seconds. Um, I haven't given this in a while. Um, if you're familiar with Saginaw on Ojibwe Island, uh, there were several accounts given, but a uh, spark fell in from one of the uh, most likely from one of the operating mills, although other accounts are given, um, fell into the ruins of an abandoned sawmill that would have been on the northern end of the middle grounds, what's now Ojibwe Island Park. And the building went up um, in flames very quickly. Um, and as the fire progressed in Ojibwe Island, um, the newspapers account that burning boards fell into the river and the boards were carried under the approach, the wooden approach, approach to the Bristol Street Bridge where the Holland Street Bridge is in Sagna today and ignited that bridge and um, set the bridge in fire and then the with gale forced winds from the Southwest, it was soon everything along the riverbank in that area was on fire. Um, and by the time it was brought under control, 300 buildings burned. And we'll look at a more um, detailed account of the fire in a second. But I just want to give you an idea. I mean, this isn't a novel where we don't know the end. So I'll give you kind of an idea so you get your bearings. But this was from the Detroit free press and just shows the smoking area that goes through. So if you're familiar with Saginaw, um, Tilden is Water Street today. Um, and I just touched my screen and it did something. And then um, Franklin Street. But so if you're thinking of uh, Saginaw today, um, it would be south of the business district. And I am sorry, I have done. And it was um, the fire raged by for three hours, um, fanned by a southwest gale, um, and you can just see what the um, the newspaper headings. And so now I wanted to just kind of recount the story of the fire, the progress of the fire. You, this is a map we created. 
of the fire um, route. And there are some areas on here you would expect to be covered with um, um, showing as red with the burned as being just um, impacted by the fire. But there's been a lot of fill along the river since that time. So uh, that's why there is white next to the river. Those were just low areas that weren't developed or were docks and other area. So what happened was about 345 um, flames, a spark fell into the abandoned, um, the ruins of the sample and camp mill. Um, then um, within a few minutes, as I said, it went to the Bristol Street Bridge. Um, which the approach burned, not the bridge itself, but the wooden causeway leading to the bridge. And then it soon was in the factories along the river. Um, and as you can see, the route um, was really um, to the southwest. And you can see how it really impacted the residential district. It described that homes burned melted like ice cream on a summer day. Um, the newspapers describe how people had seconds to spare um, to just grab things out of their homes. And the newspapers could be um, fairly brutal at the time on recounting what um, people's reaction during the fire. There's one newspaper article that described a woman who had in panic grabbed sofa cushions, um, decorative throw pillows from her parlor, which may have been her most treasured possession. And the newspaper published that that was a stupid thing for her to have done. Um, but there were really stories of bravery and also of, of amazing loss. Um, the fire as it spread um, traveled up to St. Vincent's Orphanage, which would have been on the north, um, the northeast corner of the burned over area where it says Emerson. And the sisters, um, the newspapers described how the sisters in charge of the orphanage, um, they um, met in an orderly manner, um, were able to get the children out of the orphanage. Um, there are some accounts that describe that actually one infant had to be tossed into a, uh, a stretch sheet and that one isn't fully documented. And um, there really was the feeling that this fire was going to, the wind was so strong, they really thought that it would at least burn several blocks into the business district. They thought maybe what, Genesee Avenue, which is wider, that they might be able to control it at that area, according to the fire department records and newspaper records at the time. But there were those that thought it simply would burn until it reached the end of the city, edge of the city over a mile away. And it was moving at that rate. Um, and so the sisters just simply lined the children up and started um, marching the children out of the out of the city. Um, there, the St. Mary's Hospital, um, which was right, um, would have been where it says, well, that's easy enough on the map, it says H, um, where it says H on the map. Um, it, St. Mary's had just completed a new brick building, um, but brick buildings were burning um, really large brick residences were uh, what would happen is the intense heat of the fire would break the glass, the interior of the building would be ignited, and buildings that were thought fireproof, homes that were thought to be fireproof were destroyed in moments. So the hospital, um, they really thought that it would be destroyed. So they um, evacuated all of the patients into uh, the grounds of the school across the street. And the newspaper described just the horrible experience of um, being, you know, watching the city burn and all of the smoke and heat and, you know, really not knowing how safe you are at that point. Um, so, and then there's another point that is kind of another on this map in the lower right hand corner. And that's a house that was on, and I should have probably talked about that earlier, but it was on the very, but it's part of kind of the mythology of it. The house is on the very southeastern part of 
where the fire came southwestern part of where the fire came in to the area and so the wind was fanning it away but that house was actually um was where the historical society of Sagna county which is now the castle museum started in the 1960s and at that time we are my predecessors are we really were taught that the that the building was fireproof and that's why it survived the fire um in later years i had been involved with stabilizing the house before a new owner had it and discovered that it was a much more um dramatic story it was a um, uh, a case of the house has two roof levels and the family was able to get out there out onto the roof and beat out the flames, but the house was still badly damaged in the fire. So a lot of what happened afterwards was kind of made a little more sensational. And I have fires of the photographs of the aftermath. Um, then the Detroit papers and even the New York Times um, published articles about the fire and the destruction in Michigan's third city. Um, the newspapers were very, um, gave a lot of coverage to the loss of jobs, which is really um, very interesting at that time, because, um, you know, when you think with 250 people left homeless, um, you assume that, um, that that's going to be your major concern, but they were also equally as concerned with the people who were thrown out of work. Um, this is an ice house, which you wonder what happens to an ice house in case of a fire. Um, the building burned and the newspapers described how the ice melted and ran down to the river and into the street in dirty streams. The building that is immediately to the south of the ice house is Saginaw City Hall, which had just been completed and was spared not because it was fireproof, but because it was south of where the fire entered the district. In fact, it would be destroyed by fire in April of 1935. Um, this is just a view in the background from the Detroit paper. Um, and this is just Warren Avenue um, looking towards Hoyt. And you can just see the ruins that um, survived. Those were once houses and um, the newspaper pointed out that while the, we, the people were very fixated on the idea that huge mansions had been destroyed, that, the, that there were over 100, I bought, there were 250 homes destroyed, and probably over 200 of those were fairly modest dwellings, and the newspaper said, and no less dear to their owners. One of the things when you look at these photographs of the devastation that becomes apparent other than the details and how little there is left of the homes are the people that you see in the days after in the, in the morning and the days following the fire. Um, the photographs I have are from two sets of photographs that were taken, which were sold as souvenirs of Great Sagna's Great Fire, one by Crop photographers who were in the west side and the other by Sagna's Goodrich brothers. Um, and this is um, just the street and notice how little is really left. And um, the fire was brought under control um, in about three hours and a lot of it had to do um, with, of course, the bravery of the Sagna Fire Department, the help that we had from Flint, Bay City, and other fire departments. Actually, um, the trains brought, brought in fire equipment from Flint and um, Bay City. Um, but beyond this heroic effort, what really made the difference was the wind subsided and changed directions. So you get this very, um, really kind of remarkable clean line I'm pointing at my screen and you can't see me point, but it's just kind of amazing when you look at, you know, in one side of the block, the houses are almost untouched. The other side of the block, it's completely, um, it's just chimneys and piles of dust. Um, and this is just the days after. The newspaper described that the morning after the fire um, was like a holiday. It was a Sunday morning and, um, which I find a very odd description to describe uh, the event after the fire as being like a holiday, but you could see people going into the burn, they called it the burned over district. Um, 
to see what um, to see the ruins and that um, that there was this huge cloud of smoke that hung over the city and the uh, over the area and actually the whole area city. And I just want to point really kind of want you to focus on the next images. I haven't done this in a while, and I hope these are the next images are of people next to the ruins. Um, the newspaper described that people um, would find the location where their homes were located and go through the wreckage looking for anything. Um, the one item the museum has in the collection, I don't have a photograph of it in this program, I don't, at least I don't think I do, but is a spoon that's made from a roll of melted dimes. And it was um, belonged to, uh, the dimes belonged to a child who lived on um, Howard Street, and the dimes, according to the family story, represented what he had earned on his newspaper route. The family found them, and the his parents had it mounted on a sterling spoon that's engraved May 20th, 1893, and on the reverse Sagna, a uh, very poignant and macabre reminder of what occurred. But um, when you look at the photographs, you can just see how little remains. Um, and just, um, and you'll start to see more people going through the ruins. Um, and you just get a sense of um, those were brick foundations with wooden houses, but you start to see the people. And notice how the wood sidewalk survived. The fire was sporadic in that sense. And these are undoubtedly people looking through. The newspaper did say, the newspapers did co um, comment how people would go through the community and look um, for pieces of glass that were melted into grotesque forms to keep as souvenirs. Um, so, but I'm assuming that everyone in this photograph is, um, is um, looking through their own the basement of their own tragic loss. Um, and one of the things that happened the day after the fire was um, the community leaders um, had a public meeting and they, um, and they announced, the community leaders announced that the city could take care of its own. Um, that it had the resources and really refused outside aid. And we'll talk a little more, but this is the view from the roof of St. Mary's Hospital. If you look at the left of the photograph, there's a, square, a house with the, a square tower on it. That house is still there today and is very recognizable. Um, there's another house in the distance that's still very recognizable. And what's interesting is, um, if you look really carefully at these images, you can see one image. If you look in the center, um, you can see where they're starting to reconstruct, uh, not reconstruct, but construct a temporary shanty for people to live in. Um, and one of the things, if you look very carefully at the photographs, you'll see there's photographs of people walking down the street. and with parasols, and I never fully understood what those were, but I found in the Detroit Free Press um, an ad for uh, an excursion to Saginaw um, on the Flint and Paramark Railroad, Sunday, May 28, 1893. The Arbeiter Zunga Verein will give an excursion to Sagna and by the Flint Paramark Railroad, Sunday, May 28, leaving for the Fort Street Union Station at 8 p.m. and arrive in Sagna at 11.30 a.m. A grand concert at the Arbeiter Hall and garden both um, and garden both afternoon and evening. This excursion will give excursionists an opportunity to visit the ruins of the Great Fire and ample time to visit friends. Fare for the round trip only two dollars and children at half fare, which I find um, a little um, disconcerting. And it really made me look at this photograph very differently. This, um, if you look at the left of this image, you'll see St. Mary's Hospital, which was on the very edge of where the fire was brought under control. And if you're familiar with St. Mary's Hospital, on the northern edge is Hoyt Street. And that is um, 
that is the street that's in the foreground. Um, but when you look very carefully, and I haven't done this program, I think there should be a close up. Oh, it isn't. Um, if you look very carefully, no, it isn't. So I'm going to go back. Look carefully at the people with their parasols, and you realize those aren't people going out to look for their home. There are people that are walking a few blocks from where the fire was brought under control and walking into the community gawking at the loss and the disaster. And the loss was really. Um, was amazing if you were one of the homeowners. So a lot of people did have insurance. A lot of people did not have insurance. Um, and this is the ruins of what had been probably a fairly substantial home. Um, so this brings us really to the archeological part of it. Um, I used to work for a nonprofit housing agency and we had acquired a, 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 a dilapidated abandoned house that we removed, but it was, uh, in the area where the fire had um, had been impacted by the fire. And I knew that the house that we'd removed had been constructed in the early 20th century. So when I went back to work, this is the second time I've worked at the museum, I was able to make arrangements with Neighborhood Renewal Services, the former, the, the agency for which I used, for whom I used to work. And we were able to, um, um, to do some exploration on that site. And we called it Project 1893. Um, and our archeologist was there on Tuesdays and Thursday through the September of 2011. And what was amazing was we, as the excavation um, started to move forward, um, and this is just gives you an idea of where it's located. Um, so if you're looking at the center where you see, um, if, can you see my, cur if you can see my cursor, and I hope you can, um, this is the area where we had access to, um, um, to um, do the, uh, to excavate. And it, there had been a house here until about two, from about 1905 to 2000. Um, and we knew that uh, one house had been destroyed here and another house here in the fire of 1893. And actually we knew this entire block had been destroyed in the fire of 1893. It had been um, completely burned over in the fire of 1893. In fact, where my cursor is right now, where you see this large gray roof, that is where the largest house lost in the fire was located. Um, and at first, um, I, and I look older than that now, even a decade later, um, but here I'm with our archeological team and our archeologist, um, no, our archeologist is off um, in other photographs, um, but we started to do tests. And at first uh, there really wasn't anything, but as they started to get down dig deeper, um, they started to find, these are each of the squares are where they did test, shuffle tests. Um, they started to find evidence of a fire. Um, and we knew, unfortunately, it's the one block we don't have a lot of photographs of. So where, you, where I pointed out that large gray roof, um, that is where the, the remaining walls, that was Philip Ketchum's home, which was a very substantial home which they thought would had the newspapers described um, was going to survive the they had thought would survive the fire but did not um, because the windows broke and the interior ignited. Um, and you can see um, when you look at this photo, you can see that they're starting just as kind of an aside, they're starting to um, to restring the telegraph and telephone wires in the neighborhood. And so as we started to find remnants of what um, had been a house, we started to do, well, concurrently with that, we started to do research. Um, and visually, the first record we could find is um, this site in 1860, in the 1867 app, um, Bird's Eye View of Sagna, where I have my cursor right now, where it says Crazy Street, and then Jefferson is where I, where I am. That is the corner of Holden and um, South Jefferson, where we located, found the remains of the house. In the 1885 um, 
um, bird's eye view, we were able to find the house I need to locate. Um, so it would be Brady by that point. So it's this um, point right here is where the house was located. Um, now, one of the things you may notice as dense as Sagna is located, is constructed, there's a lot of vacant land in the middle. And that's because that area was very low and subject to flooding, even as late as the 1870s and even into the 1880s. Um, and this is just a view from the Detroit papers of the area. Um, behind that in the low area, there was Henry Passolt's soap factory. And that's um, had been associated with the, um, he was the one who's the house where the, say, the historical museum started. Um, just a photograph. So the right-hand side is pretty close, is just um, beyond, just south of where um, the site is located. What's interesting when we started, these are the um, Sanborn fire maps. Um, this is a 1901 fire map of the neighborhood. And you can see that um, nothing has been constructed on that site, which is interesting when we start the slide that I had when I started, um, I commented, um, the newspaper said that the neighborhood had been rebuilt. This is eight years after the fire of 1890, of May 20th, 1893. And if I looked at an earlier outline and knowing the neighborhood, these areas where it's blank on this empty lots on this block would have been completely struck, constructed, built over. So um, it starts to make one wonder how accurate is it that the community um, really rebuilt itself completely in the years, in the first year or two after the fire. Um, we do know by 1935, there was a house, actually it was about 1905 that it was constructed on the site. So that's the one where it says 105, 103 is the house that um, had been removed. Actually, there were two houses on the site. Um, so what we know, um, what our research showed was, when was the house built? Who lived in there in 1893? Um, what we found was um, that in 1893, the house was a rental house. And it was, um, it was a, a family of adult siblings and their, um, and their probably their parents, the adult siblings and their parents living with them. And um, we know that they did have insurance um, and it's someplace listed on the following list. And if you really want to, you can find it, but they did have insurance on the contents of the house. And as I said, I haven't given this in a while. I should circle where they are. Um, but it's really fun to look at. Um, it isn't fun, but it is interesting to see um, the insurance that people had and also really how much was lost, but also how much the value of money has changed. Um, so with that in mind, we started doing um, more research. One of the things we discovered um, when they started to find the remnants of the basement walls, um, we discovered there was a tremendous amount of fill that had been brought into the site. So after the shovel testing was done, we actually had to have a contractor come in and remove a couple of, I think it was a couple of feet of fill that had was unrelated to the archaeological remains of the site so that we had access to the actual site, the actual remains. Um, so these are just photographs that really um, give us the kind of what was found. Um, and it was a lot, actually. Um, when you look at the photographs that um, that you saw uh, after the fire, um, what remained was a basement. Um, so the first thing they started finding were bricks and more bricks. And then they started to discover an entire basement wall. And you can start to see charred wood. This is, um, we're in the lab and um, 
other places. And so when they start, by the time the excavation started, um, it was very interesting. The house that we removed was set back in from where the original house had been located. Um, and the post fire home had been constructed on the site after, um, after the fire and uh, in the early 20th century, that had been constructed in the early 20th century actually was um, set back. So this is why so much of the basement, it was just entirely just a really good situation for preserving um, the remains of the basement. One of the things that started as they started digging um, that became rather perplexing. Um, in some areas, they um, we were discover the team was discovering later material that um, shouldn't have been that, and there was a battery that wasn't invented until the 1890s after the fire. Um, they started to find things that shouldn't be there, um, and but we found this untouched area. And so what became apparent as we started to interpret that, understand what happened was that basically after the fire of 1893, probably the McMa members of the McMaster's family had gone in and tried to salvage a few things. Someone had gone in and cut off the sewer connection. There actually was running water and sewers in houses in 1893. And we found evidence of what we believe was a telephone as well. And um, then basically, even though a very large house was constructed just a couple lots to the south, um, this lot just basement was just partially filled in and just became kind of a debris area for the next decade. Um, and there was a tremendous amount of evidence of what the house, this is part of the lightning arrestor system. Um, these are boards that covered the brick basement floor, suggesting it may have actually had a fairly damp basement. Um, one of the things the newspaper accounts described was a strong wind um, that was like a gale. And towards the middle of the basement area, they actually found this charred remain of, uh, remains of a basement window. Oops. Um, keys that opened doors that had been lost in the fire. Um, this is part of what would have been called a nodder. It's kind of like a first form of um, bobblehead. Um, and remember the newspaper described that um, the glass was melted into grotesque shapes and made souvenirs. I think this is part of a lamp prism. Um, we found melted marbles, parts of miniature bottles. Um, this was what appears to be a sauerkraut produ production area, crocs, and then a horse tether uh, weight. This was used to weight horses when you want it, didn't have a hitching post. Um, and that was used as a weight and found in conjunction with the crocs. Um, silverware, um, mineral water bottles. Um, this is from a local brewery, um, a melted bottle. Um, parts of a, a button or that was a metal, uh, an agate necklace, a toothbrush. And the newspaper described that people left with no more than the clothing on their backs. And this is kind of misleading because it looks like it's untouched by the fire. It's a perfume bottle, but actually it's very, um, very warped by the heat. Um, buttons because people lost all their clothing. Um, so this made us really reconsider um, reconsider what we knew about what happened after the fire. I had done research in the past, but actually, um, when you look at the city building permits for the first two years after the fire, only 40 to 60% of the houses were reconstructed. The city would lose 10% of its population over the next decade. So the, the hundred and some families that were displaced 
the 200 and some families that were displaced by the fire were actually found new homes. If they stayed in Saginaw, um, they found new homes outside the burned over area. Um, we learned a lot about the early construction of the home. It originally was constructed by the Dorr family who had built the house probably in the early 1860s. They had the original patent on the site. Um, we also learned that um, one of the things that really became apparent, the, the papers and the city council proceedings record how at that meeting at the days after the fire, how um, this community, the city leaders um, refused all outside help. And actually um, the newspapers made a point of saying that although Bay City um, offered help that it was declined. And even though it was pointed out that Sagna had given similar help assistance to Bay City the year before. And, you know, at first, that kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstrap seemed so noble. But when actually you start looking at the city council proceedings and you look at the picture, you start to understand that um, on the part on some of the city leaders' parts, there was a misunderstanding of exactly um, the needs of the people who had lost homes, that um, there was a need for direct assistance. And there were people that went to the city council um, in the days, weeks, and months following the fire, asking them to reconsider the need for outside help because what a lot of um, community leaders thought was needed was just emergency assistance, but a number of families desperately needed long-term assistance. Um, so, you know, as the years went forward, if you look at newspaper clippings, you can really see as they went forward, um, they talk about how, um, the community um, it rebuilt itself and that whole story of this really um, struggle to rebuild in a city that was losing population um, fades. And by the 1930s, um, the newspaper headlines on the anniversary of this headline describes how this community rebuilt itself Phoenix-like from the ashes, um, but it was a really much more challenging, um, it was a really much more challenging rebuilding. Um, and so um, this was just some of the thank you that we had. But with that, that's kind of ends where I had other questions. Um, we have an exhibit at the museum that explores um, the history of the site and the fire in even more detail. And actually, if it wasn't such a beautiful summer night and I hadn't almost used my hour up, I could go on and on because there really are so many stories with it. And um, we found out so much and had so many contacts with people who had connections with the site. But that kind of gives you an idea how um, in Saginaw, this is very much part of the mythology of the city of this rebuilding from our um, pulling yourself up from your bootstraps and rebuilding. And in Bay City, a very similar fire really becomes it's a footnote to the history. There are photographs that I've seen of the area in Bay City that burned, but it's not part of the um, overall history of the city in the same way it is in Saginaw, and part really of the mythology and the, the creation of an image. So if there are questions, Kirsten, um, let me know. Yeah, um, it looks like someone wrote, at the time of the fire, was Saginaw still mostly a lumber community or was that pretty much over? Um, it was, it that's a really good question and it is not a simple yes or no answer as most questions are not. Um, certainly Saginaw still consim considered itself as a lumbering processing center, but its days of dominance of lumber trade were quickly vanishing and community leaders and people who had involved in lumbering were really working to reinvent a new economic and develop a new economic base for the community. So it would be the illusion of the lumber capital of the world, but it really, um, it's kind of like the Bruce Springsteen song, Glory Days. Um, the those days were 
gone and quickly vanishing. Um, we have in our lumbering exhibit a photograph of a huge load of, it's a very odd draw, photograph of a drawing actually, of a huge load of logs being rafted from Canada to Saginaw. So every attempt was being made to retain that. But there also were a number of abandoned sawmills and the fire started in the ruins of an abandoned sawmill. And the other th thing that you find in the city council proceedings in the weeks following the fire were people going to the city council and asking them to remove um, to do something about the abandoned sawmills because mill owners would um, would cut, remove the equipment, take it to a new site and leave, you know, just the wharves and the abandoned mill there. Saginaw did have a preponderance of locally owned mills and a lot of the mill owner, people who own sawmills also had substantial investments in commercial properties and properties in the city. So unlike the story, there's a story in the Upper Peninsula in Marquette, where a family who had made its money, I think it was in iron ore, um, when they were done with the operation, they dismantled the home they loved and moved it to Brookline, Massachusetts. In our case, people stayed in the city and tried to reinvent, but it would take a decade. And um, the list in the city directory after 18, the fire the following year, it's several pages of people who've left the city. City. And when you go back through once the more you realize that list of people left the city, the majority of those are directly associated with people who lost their homes in the fire. And it just, it used that they lost their job, they lost their home and they were not, so they found it moved on. Okay. Um, another question, did people primarily rebuild with wood or did you see a lot more brick homes? No, I think a lot of wood. Um, it still was a fairly inexpensive, it was a readily available, even though I just, I, this may contradict, seem contradictory, there still was a rat, there still was a supply of wood and it's what people were used to. There were a number of brick houses went up. Um, and, you know, I think it, there are, it was outside of what's called the even even with 19th century zoning laws, there were fire districts and this was several, um, several blocks outside the fire district. So it was mainly wood. And the one thing I think that really, um, you know, you think if you have a, a house with um, a slate roof and brick walls that you're fireproof. However, one of the things this fire really proved to a lot of people that even a building like Philip Ketchum's home, the one that was next to this fire site, that they could burn. And actually Hoyt Library, which was um, it's been a long day. I think it's four blocks south, north, three or four blocks north of where the fire was brought under control. Um, three blocks north, three and a half blocks north. I'll get it and I'll change my mind again. But even though that was three and a half blocks north, I did find in the newspaper and it had just opened three years before that, a spark fell down the chimney of Hoyt Library and rolled onto the carpeting and, it, and the Harriet Ames, who was the librarian at Hoyt, had to go out in the street and have someone help her extinguish the fire. Um, so uh, there aren't a lot of stories of adjoining building, of buildings burning outside the burned over area. There was another major fire unrelated, but caught, you know, helped by the wind. So no. Um, and see if I can make it even longer for a yes or no answer. Um, is there, is the fire the reason Ojibwe Island is now a park? Was it too expensive to rebuild? No, um, it, it is and it isn't. Um, the lumber boom was over. The, the mill that burned was an abandoned mill. So that was no desire to rebuild that. Um, the mill, the mill or mills, and I can't remember if there were two, one or two more on what was Ojibwe Island, um, was basically operated a few more years and then abandoned. And after that, Ojibwe Island, so that's 1893, simply uh, Ojibwe Island wasn't an island at all. It was a peninsula originally, um, and it was in a bayou. So the if you look at the drawings I had, it's a very different configuration. We're just allowed to kind of go to this kind of messy, marshy, 
woody, weedy mess. And I think it's in 1903, Ezra Rust purchased that property. In fact, all of the property where the waterworks is located up to where, if you're familiar with Sagna, where the white um, MCA is located. And he acquired all of that property and donate, purchased it and donated it to the community um, expressly for the purpose of creating a park. And then a, the middle grounds as a WPA project, the canal was dug that makes it into an island. And then when the river was dredged, it was greatly enlarged. So the actual site of the fire would it, where it started would have been more towards the middle of the island. And once again, a very simple question that I've made a complex answer for. Um, there's no more in the chat. If anybody would like to unmute themselves and ask a question that way, feel free. You should be able to do that. Or if you want to put something in the chat, feel free to do that as well. And you know, if I we also always invite people down. Our admission is still free um, currently. Um, and so do you feel free to come down and see our permanent exhibit in our lower level in our archaeology galleries? And um, we would um, we would love to and feel free to ask questions when you're here. Or just ask for me at the front desk. Um, another question here. It says in Bay City, we were two cities in the beginning. Was Saginaw the same way? Yes, we were more than two cities, and it's in 1889 that East Saginaw and Saginaw City were joined um, by an act of the state legislature. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank Tom for this evening's presentation and say that I'm a descendant of the Door lady who lost two homes in there, Francis Door on Jefferson Street. And I have been to your display. And I know, and I saw your name there and I realized that I didn't have as much about that as I would have, if I would have known it. And you were so generous with sharing information. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, I could, this is, I haven't given this program in a couple of years and I must say, I feel like I have about another three hours worth of stuff I feel like talking about and rearranging. Thank you so much for having me and I look forward to having everybody at the museum. Yeah, thank you so much for the presentation and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We hope to see you at one of our future programs. Take care and thanks a million. Yeah, thank you. It was wonderful.